this uh, panel the, cla the three classics because the next speaker um, is our ex-dean of education. He has uh, been a part of education his whole life, kind of like Abraham Lincoln in a sense. And um, uh, I can't say enough good things about him. And he's actually talking on what I consider the greatest piece of legislation uh, perhaps you could call it the greatest piece of social legislation, or the first piece of, excuse me, the first piece of social legislation in American history, and of course that's the Land Grant College Act. So Dr. Burr, who used to be at the, on the main campus, but he felt sorry for us people up here, and he came up here and now has retired from here, and is still uh, teaching online, Dr. Burr. Good morning. I'd like to retire, but Bill won't let me. <laughs> He's been coming back. I'm going to, uh, as the program indicates, talk about the Morrill Act of 1862. Uh, but uh, before I get to that act, I'm going to address some antecedents, uh, some things that led up to the act. And then after I talk about the act itself, <clears throat> I want to touch very briefly on some subsequent related legislation that's, uh, I think, very important to, to, uh, to touch on. Um, the uh, act itself um, addressed uh, a little bit broader um, uh, background than what I'm going to uh, talk about. I'm going to limit my uh, presentation to the agriculture aspect of the A&M. So the mechanical aspects, engineering, all very, very important, but uh, mine is gonna be limited to the uh, agriculture. Taken to the simplest uh, focus, the Morrill Act of 1862 was about education and agriculture. Both were of paramount importance to the uh, uh, from, the, from the time of the colonists who depended on farming for subsistence and clearly recognized the importance of education as well. Uh, during the 1630s, uh, over a hundred um, former Cambridge and Oxford students arrived in New England. Most of them were clergy. This gave the Northeastern colonies a head start in education and what is now known as the Boston, Boston Latin School was uh, uh, established in 1635, uh, very shortly, only 15 years after the Mayflower. I have a good friend who taught, not then, but later <laughs> at Boston Latin. And uh, I'm interested in it for, uh, for that reason as well. Cotton Mather went to school there. Um, ben Franklin. So they have some, they have some uh, pretty notable graduates. And uh, both in New England and in uh, further south, uh, <coughs> there were uh, there pretty um, um, they had petty schools and grammar schools. Petty schools were um, uh, tutors who were um, um, the better educated housewives. And the uh, clergy pitched in at the, at the grammar school. This was pretty primitive education, but it was, it was our start. Uh, the con colonial uh, reverence for education was evidenced pretty quickly by the establishment of Harvard, which was New College originally, um, a year after Boston Latin. Uh, College of William and Mary shortly after, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, uh, University of Pennsylvania, Brown, Rutgers, and uh, in 1769, Dartmouth College. All of these had different names at their inceptions, but those are, that's what we refer to them today. And they're, what do we call them? Ivy League. Seven of the nine are what we call today the Ivy League institutions. Uh, they had a head start, and uh, I think they still have somewhat of an advantage. And uh, some of their graduates, some of the graduates, some of the people who went to school 
early included John Adams, who went to Harvard, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe. These all attended, these um, uh, folks all attended uh, college. George Washington's e education, however, was um, more typical. It was uh, uh, more typical of the time for people with means. Common people had no uh, access to higher education. But if you, had, if you had some money, you uh, had some opportunities. That was basically uh, the way it was then. Uh, following uh, George Washington's father's death, um, they moved to, uh, the family moved to Bridge Creek, which had a, a school which was available to planters' sons, sons, you know, not daughter. Um, the, um, and it was for planters. Uh, again, uh, ordinary people didn't have access like this. He was also tutored by his brothers in history and literature, uh, later attended uh, Henry Williams School near Maddox Creek, and there he studied reading, spelling, grammar, geography, bookkeeping, uh, surveying, and math. He got some more tutoring from his brother Lawrence, who uh, um, gave him some background in military tactics which were uh, to prove important later. But the problem was neither college nor this kind of training that, that George Washington was exposed to was available broadly. The common people had no uh, access. It wasn't an option. Um, I'm sure all of you would have gotten an education back then, but I wouldn't have. Okay, the earliest efforts towards education in the colonies were towards meeting the needs of the Puritans. Um, but a movement away from predominantly English influence goals towards a growing Yankee culture occurred over the next subsequent few decades. John Adams noted that the revolution had, been, had begun before the war itself in the minds and hearts of the populace, in part a result of this changing face of education. Now after the revolution, skip some time, after the revolution, chaos reigned for a while regarding the disposition of territories between the established states and the Mississippi River. And while that was being sorted out, the land ordinance of 1785, um, um, which was an ordinance for ascertaining uh, the, uh, the, the disposing of lands in the Western Territory, but this was passed. Among other provisions of the ordinance, the lands bordering the Mississippi were divided into townships, and those were subdivided um, uh, into sections, and there was always a section allocated to, to uh, schooling, to education. And, uh, it was located, their section was located almost in the center um, of this um, uh, section, which minimized travel time for, um, for people. School busing wasn't good back then. <laughs> but that land ordinance of 1785 is but one example of the beginnings of federal involvement in setting aside land for education. Second example, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 uh, included in Article III an admonition that religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary, necessary to government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. This sentiment um, uh, of federal interest in education with the details of education left to the states is consistent with the omission of the mention of education in the Constitution and does nothing to diminish the uh, focus of cultural views of uh, the importance of education because they were there, clearly. And this was in harmony with Thomas Jefferson's bill for the more general diffusion of knowledge, which was never passed, but a wonderful document which uh, uh, laid the groundwork and was a rationale for an educated populace. 
A key component of this Northwest Ordinance were that provisions were made for division of the territory into um, states. Certain civil rights were guaranteed and slavery was to be prohibited. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this was an agriculture-based society. George Washington once noted that, uh, quote here, the English farmer must entertain a contemptible opinion of our husbandry or a horrid idea of our land when he is to be informed that not more than eight or 10 bushels of wheat is a yield of an acre. The benefits of uh, uh, crop rotation are obvious today, but in early colonial times, that wasn't, uh, that wasn't so. And the availability, availability of large amounts of land um, made it not that important. When the soil was depleted, there's more land available. There's plenty of land. Uh, but it began to be a, a serious problem. Soil depletion did. And it was, uh, there was part of George Washington's uh, point. Um, at that time, the uh, agricultural out output was uh, decreasing. It began to be a serious problem. Um, and farmers began to look at English practices as a possible solution. Uh, both George Washington and Thomas Jefferson consulted with the editor of uh, American Husbandry, American Husbandry, which was uh, published in London, of all places, uh, in hopes of learning more about agricultural science and improving farming methods and productivity. And this, along with the uh, development of education as a colonial focus, uh, under, under uh, understanding the need to apply agricultural science was the basis, the foundation <clears throat> for the Morrill Act. Uh, Justin Smith Morrill served in Congress continuously for 43 years. And he was, he was powerful. He had a, uh, uh, he chaired the House Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee. And he was a, a, the ultimate politician. He was, uh, uh, the moral terrorists were very important. Uh, but in his uh, second term in the House of Representatives, early on, he introduced a, a bill granting lands for agricultural colleges. This was in 1857. Um, the general idea wasn't original thinking. Uh, similar institutions uh, were uh, existed in Europe, England, France. They were into agricultural education uh, much earlier, and they became a model for what uh, the things we did later on. Um, New York's Surveyor General, Simeon DeWitt, had published a pamphlet as early as 1819 that promoted establishment of agricultural colleges. Uh, an Illinois college professor, Jonathan Turner, had a long argued for agriculture, for courses in mechanics and agriculture. And there are other prominent individuals who uh, looked at the need for agricultural education. But um, Morrill was the person who finally did something about it. Um, the 1857 um, uh, bill that he offered um, was uh, violently opposed by the, the people in the South. Alabama's Senator Clement Clay led the opposition in 1959, believing that it would result, would, would result in federal control of education. <coughs> that's a, uh, uh, that's a, a common uh, among educators today. That's uh, a real controversy, a real controversy. <coughs> the argument was that this was a state's rights issue, Clay's argument, that it would result in federal control <coughs> Of the of the uh, curricula. Anybody know about Common Core? Uh, you heard that. And because the Constitution didn't mention uh, education, uh, Clay said this was unconstitutional. Uh, 
and uh, um, this, despite Clay's and the, the South in general's opposition, the bill passed. Um, uh, Morrill was a, a, a very adroit, uh, able politician, but President James Buchanan vetoed the measure. He blocked the unconstitutionality argument, um, but he also shared the uh, common elitist view, President Finn, uh, of the college faculty that agriculture and mechanics were not legitimate criteria for higher education. You can learn that on the job. They were just, uh, um, didn't, didn't fit in higher education. Um, there had been for 20 years earlier various kinds of proposals uh, for providing federal aid for agricultural colleges, uh, parallel activity and failure for establishment of a Department of Agriculture. Um, but Morrill persevered despite the, the veto. He brought it back. The revised bill again in 1862. It was passed this time uh, without dissent in the hysteria of the Southern Democrats for obvious reasons. They weren't around. They, uh, uh, the uh, legislature at that time passed a, a Pacific Railway Act, <coughs> Homestead Act, the Moral Land Grant Act, and they did this, uh, they were able to do all this because of the absence of the uh, Southern Democrats. Uh, the Homestead Act and Moral Act were uh, kind of interesting to me, included among Johnson's 15 laws that shaped America. Just, uh, very important legislation. So, uh, Morrill, as I said, Morrill persevered, brought it up again in 1862. It passed this time again without the dissent of the Southern Democrats, and President Lincoln uh, took Morrill aside, assured him that he would sign the bill he, immediately. He let him know, and uh, he did sign it on July 2nd. 1862, uh, without any fanfare. It wasn't, uh, <clears throat> they had no idea as to um, the eventual impact that this act would have on agriculture, education, or the economy. Excuse me just a second. I live in New Mexico, a very dry here. They did know quite well, though, that there was a need for a route to education for the less privileged, and that this, this particular act would provide for that eventuality. Both Morrill and Lincoln were very intelligent, able uh, individuals, obviously, came from honorable beginnings. Neither was able to attend college, so they had a special interest in uh, increased opportunity. The most basic provision of this Morrill Act of 1862 was that each state would be provided 30,000 acres, grant, let be granted 30,000 acres for each senator and each representative in return for the state establishing and maintaining a college that would focus on agriculture and mechanical arts, A&M while still in including science, classics, and military tactics. The latter was kind of interesting. That, that was, I think the rationale for that's obvious. It was uh, during the war that this bill was passed, and it would be to their benefit to have some, have people um, trained in military science, military tactics. <clears throat> Territories and states in rebellion were excluded um, during the war. Uh, but provisions were made to include new states, and of course the states in rebellion eventually became part of this as well. Some states had no federal lands uh, available for the grants, and they were issued scrip. Uh, interesting, uh, the scrip was uh, equivalent to a dollar and a quarter per acre. That's, uh, you can't buy land like that anymore. Um, 
But at that time, that was a boring life. Uh, this script, uh, issuance of script uh, instead of land for those states who had no, didn't have those federal lands available would prevent, for example, um, Connecticut from obtaining land in Texas, uh, being granted land out of their state. It wasn't, wasn't possible, you couldn't do that. So script was the uh, solution. The problem with the script is that, as is, all, as is still true, some states managed their script sales well, some didn't. Uh, some, some states uh, uh, sold them immediately for, the, for that going dollar and a quarter rate. Some held on to them, and as prices went up, um, they, they did much better. The newer states tended to uh, retain the land instead of selling it, um, retaining it and leasing. Um, as a result, Air, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Washington, Wyoming still receive large uh, annual revenues from such as uh, timber, oil and gas leases. Um, I'm uh, I'm, I live in New Mexico now, and just recently uh, we uh, I learned that uh, our land grant permanent fund now amounts to over 23 billion, 23 billion dollars. Um, uh, 750 million is just will be distributed next year, and 85 percent goes to education. So uh, holding on to that land was a smart move by the folks in New Mexico. Uh, uh, not in my favor an anecdote here. It's interesting to me. Um, until this year, uh, our, our budget, we, we had a big, big uh, excess uh, due to oil and gas uh, income. But last year, when times were tough, the uh, Democrats in our, this Democrat dominated uh, uh, legislature, but the Democrats in the legislature decided we need to tap that uh, permanent land grant fund we, we need more money. Uh, their, uh, the, uh, their primary opposition wasn't a Republican, it was another Democrat. The guy who was in charge of that fund, um, there's no way, Jose, we're not gonna tap that fund. And fortunately they didn't, and we have, you know, things are, times are better now. Um, and, but uh, that, that uh, going into those permanent funds uh, in all these states has been controversial because it's not a smart thing to do, but sometimes, sometimes uh, it might be necessary. Um, but that's a, uh, that permanent land grant fund for New Mexico is a lifesaver because we're one of the, <clears throat> one of the poorest of states. Um, provisions relate to that, that uh, the, uh, uh, anything in sales had to invest in, had to be invested in sound stocks. Uh, you know, that, uh, I'm, that's a, uh, you wonder what's a sound stock today or tomorrow or the next. But anyway, there was a provision that you would involve in uh, uh, sound stocks with an annual percentum of at least five five percent, leaving the capital untouched, um, and the interest would be used to support the maintenance of their A&M College. Now, subsequent to the Act of 1862, um, there are several events that, need, that I want to touch on. One uh, provision of that Act was that no portion of the fund or interest could be applied to the purchase, erection, or, or uh, preservation or repair of buildings. Now, think about that. This Act's passed in 1862. Uh, we're going to put, put up buildings. What's the problem? Obviously, the war made uh, made it almost impossible to get started in uh, in Akron uh, and building these uh, uh, A&M colleges. Very slow getting started. Uh, funds were just almost non-existent, and uh, also another problem was the availability of faculty and students. Uh, we were at war, um, but following 
establishment of the land grant colleges. Um, uh, after the war, things picked up pretty good. And this pre existing interest that we had in agriculture experimentation, going way back to George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, was exacerbated. And, and by 1886, there were 14 states that had uh, established demonstration farms um, that were evolving into research centers. Sounds like a good idea, and the value of uh, those was obvious. And uh, Seaman Knapp, who was a professor at Iowa State College, wrote a paper that was the basis of a bill uh, introduced in Congress by House Agriculture Committee Chairman William Hatch. Um, uh, uh, his initial bill uh, trial uh, failed, but after several revisions, the Hatch Act finally passed signed by President, President Grover Cleveland in uh, 1887. This was a uh, very important um, appendage to uh, the uh, Morrill Act. This act provided funding for the establishment and continuous support of agricultural experiment stations. Every state has ag experiment stations now operating under land grant colleges. Um, the contribution of these ag research stations uh, to the America and the world is just immeasurable, can't be overstated. Uh, by 1890, there had been a singular progress, and the moral, the moral uh, uh, saw a deficiency and uh, had introduced seven additional bills uh, to aid those land grant colleges. Uh, that were sending, sending out by this time uh, large numbers of uh, uh, graduates. And at this time, he um, uh, proposed that he, uh, his second land grant act was passed and signed by President uh, Benjamin Harrison. And this particular act, this 1890 land grant act, provided additional dollars to the existing colleges, land-grant colleges, uh, but most importantly, states that had limited enrollments to whites <clears throat> were forced to either integrate or establish separate but equal, and we know what that means, it never was, but uh, they were forced to either integrate or establish institutions that would admit blacks. The text of the bill clearly stated that no money shall be paid out under this act to any state or territory for the support and maintenance of a college where a distinction of race or color is made in the admission of students, um, but the establishment and maintenance of such colleges separately for white and colored students shall be held to be a compliance. This resulted in the establishment in 18 of the segregated southern states of uh, land grant institutions that would serve the needs of blacks who would seek uh, education in agriculture and mechanical arts. Uh, some states had to create new institutions. Um, others simply applied the funding to what is now known as the historical black colleges and universities. Um, this second of Morrill's land grant um, uh, bills was obviously uh, very, very important uh, in, in providing access to higher education for blacks. It got, uh, the, the black schools got off to a good start. Initially, they were more involved with remedial classes. You, think, you can understand why that was necessary because of the education that was available to blacks. Um, then they went uh, to teacher education and because they needed to staff the black schools, uh, first through 12th grades, uh, there was a more pressing need, but, but they did go, uh, they did apply funding eventually uh, to agricultural and mechanical, <coughs> mechanical arts. George Washington Carver, who you all have heard of, was uh, one of one example of thousands of blacks who profited from this, from Morrill's land grant uh, legislation. 
He was the first black student at a, what was to later be Iowa State University, one of the original land grant colleges. He earned bachelor's and master's degrees there, doing uh, research at their experiment station, uh, which was a product of the Hatch Act, as you remember. And he later established a, an international reputation through his research at Tuskegee Institute, Tuskegee University, uh, which was, uh, Tuskegee was one of the 1890 land grant schools. Now, the land grant college's mission had evolved from simply teaching to include research as a result of the Hatch Act. And the third of today's standard university goals, service, uh, was set up by the Smith Lever Act of 1914 that established a cooperative ex extension service which operates under the land grant colleges. And this cooperative uh, extension service provides consultation, publications, and other rural outreach. And I remember when I was a little kid, uh, an extension agent coming to a far our farm, and I'll never forget, I know how to graft a uh, good pecan stock onto native stock. I can do it today because well, I learned that from an agent coming out who also uh, taught us about how to manage uh, uh, terracing on our hilly land. So I, I, uh, I saw it. I saw it happen. Of course, when you get my age, you see, you've seen a lot of history. <laughs> so the Smith Lever Act of 1914 established that cooperative extension service. Problem is, it was uh, limited to the 1862 land grant inst uh, institutions, oh. land grant colleges. The 1890 colleges, um, pr predominantly black, um, only got um, uh, into cooperative extension after 1977, when the uh, National Agricultural Research Extension and Teaching Policy Act was passed. Oh, that's almost 100 years um, delay there. <clears throat> the same year, 1977, the uh, 1890 land grant colleges were first provided uh, funds for agricultural research through the Evans Allen Act. And it should come as no support, no surprise to any of us that uh, the Historically black college and universities are still seeking equitable support. Um, uh, currently, today, they are uh, looking for equity and state matching federal uh, state matching funds for uh, federal funding. It's 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 it's, a, it's disgraceful. Uh, this is not a full list of the legislation that followed the Morrill's 1862 Act, but it's it's the pretty much the most important, except for one exception. In 1994, land grant status was uh, awarded to 29 Native American colleges. Now these serve as feeders to four-year schools primarily. Uh, they're not A&M, they uh, they're funded through land grant. So <clears throat> we have the original 1862, the 1890, and then the 1994, three different groups of land grant colleges. Uh, some of the original land grant colleges, such as Berkeley, Cornell, MIT, uh, have evolved to become as inaccessible <coughs> and as elite as the original uh, colleges that are today the Ivy League schools. It's hard to see Berkeley as a Caltown college uh, at, at uh, MIT. Um, Others, such as Louisiana State University and Agriculture um, uh, and Mechanical College, is LSU and A&M is the official name, um, have developed and continue to operate A&M colleges in tune uh, with the aims of the, of the original Moral Act. We have a, one of the uh, uh, best uh, veterinary medicine schools in uh, Baton Rouge. I was going to 
on the point eastern. I can't tell where I where to stand. But anyway, two miles east of us, across the river, uh, there is uh, the Red River Research Station, a model uh, farm, experimental farm. Um, uh, two miles as a coal flies, we go there. Uh, if you don't go as a coal flies, you have to go through the river. Uh, you have to go around the bridge. But anyway, it's in Bossier Parish. Uh, that's a result of the Hatch Act. Um, and they, they're focusing on crops grown in the nearby locales. Pecan Research and Experimental Station, Extension Station, is two miles south of us from here. Um, LSU has 15 other research stations throughout the state, and they focus on a wide variety of uh, locally important um, uh, issues, such as freshwater aquaculture, um, the crawfish or mud bugs, as they're called locally, sugarcane, cotton, rice, cattle, um, a wide variety. And they're supplemented by LSU cooperative extension offices in all 16 parishes. So LSU today, LSU and A&M College has a presence all over the state in the experimental farms and also in cooperative extension. Um, we, we, I say we, I, I sort of say they, but we, I've worked at LSU system for 31 years, so I have a, a real interest in it. Uh, we've done what the Moral Act was uh, and the Hatch Act meant to do. They, uh, Louisiana Southern University, also located in Baton Rouge, was one of the uh, historical black college universities that got land grant status in uh, uh, the act of 1890. <clears throat> they play a lesser but important role. They do a lot of outreach to the, the uh, black community. <coughs> they also have an experimental research station, 385 acre station in South Louisiana, and they have several agriculture-related related degrees, including one in pre-pet pre medicine. Um, Morrow, when he first argued for this land, these land-grant colleges, had pointed out that wheat, tobacco, and potato harvest had declined severely by the 1850s. By 1900, though, the number of farms and wheat production had doubled, number of cattle had tripled, um, further results, in 2017, the USA, I just uh, picked out one, for example, 2017, the USA led the world dollar value of wheat exported, and agriculture, agriculture has experienced a trade surplus, you know, we've been worried about trade deficits. We've had a trade surplus since 1959, uh, and with China becoming our largest export market for agriculture, the lasting effects of uh, Morrow's uh, Land Grant Act and subsequent le legislation um, very clear. The, the pre-land grant colleges is focused on uh, theology, philosophy, Latin, and Greek. And the students and administrators of these elitist institutions were generally critical and dismissal of the A&M concept. Uh, farmer students, um, but you cannot, uh, today, we cannot uh, deny the contribution of these A&M colleges um, um, to any, uh, national and international economies. Uh, we, to some extent, feed the world. And today, these institutions, all institutions today are really looking at the model of the A&M colleges in terms of teaching, research and service. Now, I, I know sometimes it's lip service, but, but it's a, uh, that, that's our, uh, our standard today, and that came from land grants. Um, Rosen noted, in, uh, uh, that, and I'll quote this, of course we now know that proponents of land grant college acts have decisively had the last act, last laugh, last laugh. Today, historians look back on the creation of land-grant colleges as one of the most important innovations in the history of American higher education. <clears throat> Morrow's 1862 land-grant act has far surpassed expectations and is certainly a, an example of 
great reservation. President Abraham Lincoln, who signed the bill into law, would have certainly been very pleased had he but known uh, what was to come. 